Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Ian. Okay, I'm Craig Rossborough, as you probably already know. Uh, and my talk is Chemistry Stuff, How Chemists Trick You and You Will Never Break Free of Our Iron Grasp. Notice the little F-E there, little chemistry joke? Right in on the first slide, let's go. It is going to be this painful the whole way through, I promise you. Uh, okay. Now, uh, I already spoke about some of this to you, but just for all the speakers who didn't get a chance, uh, I'll be talking mainly about uh, breaking it up into these sort of different categories here. Hybrid car batteries, orange juice, laundry detergents, and smells. Uh, first of all, car batteries. Now, hybrid cars, I do love cars. I really do. I do not like hybrid cars, but not in the sort of overly macho Jeremy Clarkson way. Mine's is more based on this idea that the cars are sold to people on the idea that you're doing less damage to the environment. But this isn't always true. Uh, and this is mainly because in the way that the cars are manufactured. You see, first of all, what happens is, is that basically all hybrid cars, like Toyota will often boast about how great theirs is, but it is basically the same as all the other hybrid engines out there. See, they're all made from uh, just nickel batteries. But these nickel batteries can be very damaging to the environment because the mining process to get the nickel can be very bad. Because what they do is they, they basically smash up a ton of the rocks. They then put that on a truck and take it elsewhere, where it's then processed. And this gives off a lot of carbon, dioc uh, carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide, which is really bad for the environment. And then it's sent to another plant where it's made into the battery parts and then eventually again on to the place where the cars are actually manufactured. And all this extra transporting does do a lot more damage to the environment. And when you take into account the actual miles per gallon you get on top with a hybrid engine, uh, a lot of the benefit is lost from people just driving like maniacs, uh, revving the engines way too much when you can get almost the same results just from going up a gear and just driving more sensibly, removing weight from your car, and all sorts of other things like this. I just feel that sometimes the hybrid cars are sold in a very inappropriate way where they make people think that they're saving the environment, but in actual fact, the changes that it makes to the damage it does are really small, if even noticeable at all. Uh, second of all, orange juice. I really like orange juice. Orange juice is great. Now, the problem with orange juice comes from sort of its we pr uh, the way it's preserved. And this, this is one of my favorite chemistry tricks of all. Because you see, there's the three main different types of preserving them are aluminum cans, uh, pasteurization, and concentration. Now, the aluminum can stuff isn't really used much over here. It's just what you think, just it, can it, off it goes. And just same with soup, stuff like that. And uh, just preserve the way you think. Now, pasteurization. Basically, most of the orange juice that we get here has pasteurized at one point or another. Uh, and how, uh, when it's pasteurized, generally tends to determine whether or not it's concentrated. Uh, and this is a little graphic I've got here. Now, from the not concentration, what happens is just the oranges are all bung in the top, ex all the juice is extracted, then it's pasteurized, you get your orange juice, and then it's sold on. Uh, but from the from concentrate stuff, this stuff's really interesting. Is you just throw the oranges in the top, then through heat and pressure, uh, a lot of the water is removed. And uh, doing this removes quite a lot of the taste as well. And pasteurizing it just destroys whatever taste is left. Uh, the orange juice uh, that's made in this way, uh, does anyone want to take a quick guess at how long you can keep orange juice that's been made like this, which is then put into vacuum packs? Anyone might take a quick guess? Year. Up to a year. Quite right, Ian. I'm pretty sure I told you that earlier, so thanks for ruining it. Uh, this, to be honest, most of the stuff that you drink won't actually be a year old. However, a lot of cheap uh, orange juices, which are used as ingredients and other things, will be made using this method. And it's quite disgusting when you think about it, because to actually get the orange juice tasting like it does, they add something called a flavor pack, which... Is, sounds quite awful the the way they've put the spin on it because basically because all the the taste has been destroyed they then have to take things that taste like orange juice from elsewhere mix it in your orange juice and then give it out you end up with this sort of weird mush which isn't actually orange juice but because of regulation has to be called orange juice and that's how we get our orange juice all the freshly squeezed goodness right 
Second of all, thirdly, rather, laundry detergents. Now, uh, there is a little bit of debate right now about uh, bio uh, lo uh, laundry powders versus non-bio, about whether it is the enzymes in it which causes the reactions which leads to most people buying non-bio. Uh, however, recently, I believe, uh, the consensus has shifted to that it's not actually the enzymes which cause the bad reactions on skin. It's more just to do with what else is in it. Uh, especially for someone like me who has this problem myself. I found that just switching brands was enough, but uh, most people that ma uh, most companies that make uh, bio uh, laundry powder will actually go and make non-bio stuff as well, even though it's just slightly less efficient. Uh, but the stuff I'm concentrating on is the really cheap stuff. Now, basically all uh, non-bio stuff contains these three things here. Water softeners, fairly self-explanatory. Soap and surfactants, that's just uh, the soap and stuff to lower the surface tension of the water just to make it a bit better at cleaning. And bleach, good old bleach. Now you see there's two ways in which the bleaches work. They can either be reducing bleaches or they can be oxidizing bleaches. Now the reducing bleaches which aren't used very much in the wor anymore work in this sort of fashion here. What they do is they take these long uh, hydrocarbon chains which are uh, unsaturated and then just saturates them, which basically means you're breaking this little bond in here and turning it into two hydrogen carbon bonds. And what this does is, is that it, these, if a compound with quite a few of these double carbon, carbon bonds here will emit light in the visible spectrum. And what it does is it breaks these up to push the light that's being made out of the visible spectrum. So what's happening is it's not actually cleaning the stains off your clothes. All it's doing is making them invisible. Uh, and coincidentally, that, that's uh, what's going on here is kind of what happens in a suntan lotion. In suntan lotion, what they do is they make these long chain hydrocarbons with uh, double bonds in them, which uh, absorb light in the UVB range, which is a uh, UV split up into these three different parts. We've got UVA, UVB, UVC. The UVC stuff doesn't normally get to the planet's surface. UVA doesn't really do much to our skin. The UVB stuff is the stuff that causes cancer. And what it does is it absorbs the light and then emits it again, and that protects your skin. Uh, so there's a little bit extra on top of it there for you. And then there's the oxidizing bleaches. These, these are the ones that are more commonly used. These are a bit more complicated. They just break down the bonds uh, so that they're not these full molecules anymore to get the same effect. Uh, the molecules aren't kept intact. And it tends to be slightly better, but again, it does it by exactly the same thing. All it does is it alters the molecules so it does not li emit light in the visible spectrum. Uh, and if you've ever been to, uh, I don't know, one of the Glasgow unions when they're doing uh, neon lights about and that, often what will, you can actually do this if you take uh, clothes that have been washed in really cheap powder, just put uh, UV lights on them, you'll see just the stains of all the latent curries and beer from many students uh, before just showing up. And lastly, smells. Now this one's really interesting. This is the one that I didn't get the chance to talk about very much. Uh, there's uh, basically pretty much everything you buy has some kind of perfume in it. Your coffee has perfume in it to make it smell like coffee. Your popcorn has, po has a perfume in it to make it smell like popcorn. Your gravy has, uh, has more perfume in it to make it smell like gravy and bread as well. This is one that's really interesting. I'll be talking about this on the next slide. Now, there, as you probably know, there's this myth that supermarkets pump, basically have little uh, bread plugins to make the smell of bread throughout the store. And now this is definitely true of the smaller supermarkets, but the bigger ones tend to save money even more now. The ones with the big bakeries, what you'll find is they circulate the smell. If you've ever walked into Asda's and wondered why there's fresh bread smell at the front of the store, even though the bakery's at the back, that's because what they do is they pump the air from the back of the shop to the front of the shop. So when you come in, you think, oh, fresh bread, I'm going to buy tons of Coke for some reason. <laughs> uh, tons of Coke, nappies, and crisps, because they're on offer. I don't really know if that works. Uh, so psychologists seem to think that smell of fresh bread works just makes me want to buy bread but apparently it works for other things as well uh, cheap gravies cheap gravies when you pop them open you'll get an instant smell of gravy that's more to do with the actual perfume they put in it because the gravy granules themselves are quite solid the taste the molecules that give it the taste are different from the ones that give it the smell uh, be just because of the way it's manufactured now, this is the culprit here for this uh, bread stuff. Now, this is made quite a lot. 
Uh, and it's it, they do sell it in plugins, but if you try and ask any of the major supermarkets who's actually buying this, they're quite hush hush about it, which I thought was quite hard. If you if you go online and try and find out who's actually using these, there's a lot of people buying them, not a lot of people admitting to them. But they're essentially just these Glade plugin things that you put into your wall. Uh, I, I do believe a lot of the smaller supermarkets are using these, but I believe some of the bigger chains are trying to get away from it now, mainly because they can't get away with it now because people like me are ruining it for them. Uh, not only that, but there's a lot of other problems with perfumes right now. Uh, perfume industry is a really, really big industry. Uh, in 2007, uh, free artificial fragrances put into uh, perfumes, things like that, were, uh, were believed to be causing a significant problem for people with allergies, especially in America, for a reason I'll be getting to in a minute. Uh, mainly because there's uh, 20, 26 uh, different molecules which are really essential to perfume manufacture are well-known allergens and this is a really big problem. Uh, not only that but uh, a lot of these uh, products aren't soluble in water so they have to use organic solvents uh, such as these ones here uh, and these can also cause, uh, oh, these ones are a bit more fear mongery. These ones are to a much lesser extent. But the problem with these ones are is that when they're then put into perfumes, into aerosols, people with asthma can have extremely severe reactions to these. It's, it's a rare one, but it is a problem. Uh, thankfully, here in Europe, we don't really have to worry about that because of 2005. Uh, they made they changed the law so that all perfumes have to indicate whether they have any of these 26 allergens in them. But this is just in the EU. In America, uh, all that perfumes have to fall under is the same thing which applies to food, and that is generally recognized as safe, which sounds like such a scary term I had to Google it. Has anybody heard of this term, generally recognized as safe? It is, and you know what? It's generally not very safe because things that cause allergies don't really fall into this much. Uh, and because of this, there's no real demand for people in America to put the ingredients on their perfumes. You see, most people who make foods in that will still put them on because if someone eats something with nuts and it has a severe allergy, that's really bad for PR. But perfume manufacturers generally tend to get away with this. Uh, and that's because there's this sort of fear of comp competition. But last time I was walking about a store and ran into tons of perfumes, I just coughed a lot, so I can't, I really don't understand why women need so many perfumes, they all smell the same to me, just burning nose smell, but maybe that's more allergies than anything else, uh, and that's the idea behind that. Now, there is a reason why in America people get away with this rubbish, and that's because chemists rule the world, as I so aptly told you in my three minutes, which I thought were going to be five, and that's why I had to rush it. Uh, the petrochemical industry is the largest industry in the world, uh, making far more than banks, which surprised me how much it's worth. It's in excess of 60, $600 billion because so much of what we do relies on petrochemicals. Because it's not just the cars. If uh, the oil that comes from petrochemical used to make the plastics on the body panels of your car, and it's used to make all kinds of other chemicals as well. It's a massive, massive industry. Not only that, but the pharmaceutical industry does take advantage of this, that the average person, this in the UK, takes uh, 40,000 pills in a lifetime. This including over-the-counter stuff. Chemist these sort of things are really integral to our lives. Imagine if you had a headache and you couldn't go into Tesco's and just get some pills right off the shelf. It's really weird, things we do without really thinking about. And uh, not only that, but in America, another problem with, uh, as I'm sure we're all now aware of, that buying politicians is the best way to make money. Uh, and the pharmaceutical industry is one of the worst of these. Uh, $855 million they spent in that uh, eight-year period uh, purely on lobbying politicians. In fact, uh, last year it was, uh, I believe it was from last year, uh, one of the biggest donors to uh, U.S. political lobbying in the in America, by quite a lot, uh, I'm believed to be the largest is in fact Pfizer, the uh, chemical the chemical company in America. Uh, that's why chemistry rules the world. Uh, sorry, this has been a rather short talk as I did have to rewrite most of it <laughs> the last minute to take out some irrelevant stuff. But I'll hand you back to Ian. Thanks very much.